Hello, uh, Roger and Donna Van send you greetings from the south coast of England. We've been living here in this particular location in the UK for the last six years. And Faith Bible has been supporting us faithfully for the last 46 years, starting a, a year before Roger and I married. So thank you so much. We really, really love you guys. It's a, a treat just to have a couple of minutes to uh, share with you. Uh, by the way, speaking of years, uh, last summer I celebrated my 56th year working with Crew, formerly Campus Crusade for Christ. And Donna and I have lived in Europe uh, longer than we've lived in America. Uh, 46 uh, years uh, in Germany and most of it in the UK. We have um, three kids, they're all married, and we have a total of six grandkids, and one family lives in Texas and two live over here. So we fortunately get to see the UK ones more often. Uh, just a quick update on uh, the kind of ministry we're currently having. Uh, for the last five years, my focus has been on working with uh, ex-prisoners. I lead a project that is called New Foundations Community Chaplaincy. We have 15 volunteers in this particular part of uh, England and we come from 13 different churches and work with men as they get out of prison for anywhere up to 12 months to help them establish a new foundation for their life. The other thing that I'm doing that might be of interest is uh, for the last three years, I've been part of the preaching team at our local Anglican church. There's not a lot of time for this, but once every three months, uh, I have a chance to open God's word for the dear people that are in the same fellowship with us. I have continued to write books. As most of you know, I'm a children's author, and my latest book is for ages six to 10. It's a chapter book called Super Cousins, about four cousins with superpowers. I had a lot of fun with this one, and, and people are telling me it's just a really great, fun book for kids. Um, just a, a couple of prayer requests from each of us, and then we'll uh, close out. Uh, for me, or for New Foundations, I would ask you to pray that the Lord would just give these volunteers a natural opening to share their faith. We have uh, men that uh, are uh, hard to connect with sometimes, who have a past that has wounded them greatly. And we just look for the right opportunity to try to put a little of God's love and grace into their lives. The second uh, request is that uh, the Lord would raise up more volunteers. We have the probation service and uh, the prisons referring more people to us than we can possibly support. And we'd love to see more laborers for the harvest. I think my main prayer request at the moment is I'm starting to go into schools again, which I have not done since COVID. And I just pray for God's blessing and direction in that, so being able to just share with kids, get kids excited about writing and using their imaginations. All right, that's it. Thank you for a uh, chance uh, this morning just to have a small uh, bit of your service. Thank you for remembering us. And as Donna said earlier, we thank you so much, so much for your faithful support. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Bible Church. My name is Clois Clark. I'm one of the elders here at Faith Bible Church. We just want to welcome everyone that's come this morning. Pray it'll be a wonderful, worshipful time for you. If you happen to be watching online or uh, if uh, you just uh, are a first time visitor, we welcome you heartily and pray that it'll be a great time for you in the house of the Lord. I have a few other announcements that I need to make. Uh, since we no longer pass the offering plates, I think most of you probably are familiar by now, 
We have drop boxes in the back where you can put your tithes and offerings, one on this side, one on this side, and one in the middle. So be reminded of that. And also, if you want to give online, there's a place uh, that, uh, if you'll download our QR code, there's a place where you can give online. And so anyway, we encourage you to do that. We have some other announcements that I'd like to make this morning to you. First of all, the, uh, the engage and I'll get it here in a minute, LED. <laughs> Last time I said lead and they really got on me. LED, LED and Epic Camp, summer camp is coming up in the near future. And you need to sign up by May the 1st if, if you want to be involved in that. Secondly, there's going to be a Red Cross blood drive that's going to be given and uh, it, it will be on April the 26th and uh, you need to go to the Red Cross uh, website in order to sign up for that. And then Vacation Bible School is coming in the very near future. We need volunteers and I pray that you'll go to the website here on, at our church and that you will sign up to help and be involved and if you have children, you sign up them as well. So. These are some of the announcements that uh, we need to make this morning. I hope you will look at the, your worship guide. It will, it will enhance even more so on these announcements and what I've said. So anyway, join me as we enter into a time of worship. Heavenly Father, we bow before your holy presence to thank you for the privilege, Lord, to be in your house today. Lord, it's a privilege to come here, that we can worship you, we can give thanks to your great name. Thank you for all you have done for us. Thank you for dying for us. Lord, we come here to celebrate your death, your burial, your resurrection, and the wonderful salvation that you've given us in your dear son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you, dear Father, for redeeming us, for saving us. We come to lift up your holy name. Father, I pray also this morning that you would bless those who have come that have heavy burdens, Lord, that they're carrying, the stresses of life. Lord, I pray that the anointing power of your Holy Spirit would come and touch our lives and lift us up and strengthen us and encourage us today. Thank you for this sweet fellowship, Father. I pray that the love of Jesus Christ would be shared abroad throughout this, this group of believers, Lord, that we would love one another, care for each other, greet one another, warmly embrace one another. And then, Father, I pray for our dear pastor, Brother Mike, as he preaches your word today. Anoint him, dear Father, empower him to preach the word in the power of your spirit, that our hearts might be lifted up and that we might be instructed, Lord, in the way of the Lord. We might be better Christians, and that we might serve you in a more efficient way. And then, Father, I pray for the situation going on in Israel. It's a sad situation. The conflict going on, Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You said in your word, great prosperity shall be to those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We know, Father, there'll never be true peace until you come. But I do pray for your perfect will to be carried out in this conflict. And Lord, that you will pr protect innocent lives. We lift them up to you. May your perfect will be done in this situation, Father. We just ask for your blessings on that. And Lord, bless us as we enter into worship today. Bless our praise team as they lead us, Lord. Help us to offer a praise that would be pleasing and, and honoring and acceptable to you. And we'll thank you, Father, in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Can we all stand together this morning?
singing about and meditating on thinking about the greatness of Jesus I want you to hear the words of John here in the first chapter of his gospel words that will be familiar to you but again just think about the greatness of the one of whom we're singing about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Father, this morning I pray, Lord, open our eyes simply. We ask that we might behold wondrous things out of your law, specifically so the greatness of your son, the greatness of his name, and may we worship accordingly. Lord, help us to see to worship this one, the Lord Jesus.
we can read these words all together here in Philippians chapter 3. Join me, please. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. 
with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. of earth. Sing that once more, say. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Just this past week, the Lord was impressing on me just the importance of spending time with him in prayer. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that. We are gathered here corporately to sing together, but I specifically, just in thinking about what we've been singing together just now, thinking about the, the priority of not having our minds set on the things here of earth, but rather in heaven where Jesus is, where our Father is, I want to give you an opportunity right here in the service, just spend just a few moments in prayer, just considering this question, where is my heart? Where, where, where is my, my heart set, my mind set? Is it set on the things of earth or is it said on Jesus above and on my Father? So just, just spend just a few moments with him in prayer. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. 
come to die Oh, when I come to die Oh, when I come to die Give me Jesus Give me Father, that is a prayer. We pray, Lord, even as we this morning endeavor to turn our eyes upon Jesus, that God, the cry of our hearts would be like Paul, that there's nothing else that we desire more, that we would count all things as loss in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Father, I pray that we would desire above all else to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. So, Father, this morning, I pray that as we go through the remainder of this service, Lord, again, help us to have eyes that are open to your glory and the glory of your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Can I have the first through fifth graders come up, please? While they're making their way up there, I'll introduce myself. My name is Michael Hasty. I'm a deacon here at the church. We're going to be talking about what us adults will be talking about a little bit. But first, we're going to play a game. You guys like playing games? Yeah. I like playing games too. All right. This is a game most of you probably already know. It's called Simon Says. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to have all you line up on the stage. You guys can just kind of continue the line over there. All right. And see if you can... Can listen. Oh, not sorry. In front of the stage, yes. Choose my words carefully. All right. All right. So, Simon says, if Simon tells you to do something, you have to do it. If Simon does not tell you to do something, you do not do it. And if you do it, then, I mean, technically, yeah, you sit down. That's fine. All right. So Simon says, raise your right hand. Okay. Simon says, raise your left hand. Whoever put their right hand down needs to sit down. Simon didn't say put your right hand down, just to raise your left hand. All right, Simon says put both hands down. All right, Jane says put your right hand up. Oh, Simon didn't say, Jane said. Sorry. You guys need to sit down too. All right, Simon says turn around in a circle just once. (laughs) Simon didn't say to stop turning around in a circle. Yeah. I think we have one on the end. There we go. All right. That's argument. All right. I'll give you that. All right. So you guys can stay up. Simon says to stop turning around in a circle. Now we're reset. We're back to to where we started. All right. Simon says raise your right hand. Simon says put your right hand down. Simon says raise your left hand. Simon says put your left hand down. Simon says raise your right hand. Simon says turn around in a circle. All right. Now stop. Simon didn't say to stop though. I gave you space that time. (laughs) All right, all right, we're good. We have a couple people who kind of follow. You guys can kind of come into the middle. Good job. All right, now here's the big question. Why would we play Simon Says in church? What does Simon Says have to do with our walk with God? Raise your hand. Um, He tells us to do things that um, our minds can tell us 
things to do, but it's not what God says, and you listen to what God says, not what your mind tells you. Yeah, we need to listen to God, not what our mind says. Yes, Myra? You want to say it in the mic? I think she said ditto. We're not doing Simon Says. Just what do you think Simon Says has to do with our walk with God? Anybody else have a thought? He tells his disciples to, to do things and tell other people. Yeah. Um, I meant to bring my Bible up here. I forgot. So I'm going to cheat and pull up with my felt. Um, but we already kind of read it. The very first verse we're going to be talking about today in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, I believe. I'm going to read it real quick. Be imitators of me, brothers and sisters, and watch carefully those who are living this way, just as you have us as an example. Who are we supposed to imitate in our lives? Jesus. Can we imitate Jesus if we're listening to what Jane says to do? No. Can we imitate Jesus if we're following all of our friends and doing what they tell us to do and not what the Bible tells us to do? Can we imitate Jesus if we don't know what Jesus did? How do we know what Jesus did? But how do you know that? The gospel. I was going to say we read the Bible. Yes, we read the Bible. We have a relationship with God. We can pray with him. We can listen to him. We can read his word, right? So if we're studying, if we're watching our parents who are following Christ and studying the Bible and seeing those examples, then we know how to follow Christ too. Yes, Caleb. Um, me and my dad are doing a Bible study at our house. That's great, yes. So, just like in Simon Says, you have to do what Simon says. In our lives, we want to do what Jesus says. All right, you guys can head off that way. We are continuing in our study on the book of Philippians, and I have a confession to make. I know, and there are some, some slides up here that show that the slides that I use are in the app, and I think that by having 243 slides this morning, I broke the internet. <laughs> So they're, they're working on it. They're, they're trying to figure out how to compress things and, and move them back together. But right now, the slides are not up there. So when I talk about how they're on the app, they will be later. But it's my bad. There are way too many slides this morning, which means hopefully we'll get out of here by 1 or 2 in the afternoon. No, we'll see. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be done well before that. But I'm going to invite you to stand again. I'm, I'm going to read, and, and you can feel free to read along with me if you want. We've already done this once this morning. But I'm, I'm going to read from the New American Standard Version in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read from 17 all the way through 4.1. And it says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Great job. Please have a seat. Now, this is the app that the slides are not on yet, okay? And this is how you don't get to them, by going to Sunday morning and going to view the sermon slides. They're not there yet, but, but they will be. Now, we're gonna talk this morning about remembering who you are, okay? We're, we're talking about identity. We're talking about 
Philippians chapter 3, the verse that's our, our memory work. And as, as we get started, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Disney's movie, The Lion King. Maybe you know the movie. Um, Simba, the, the little baby lion, um, was kind of framed by uh, his evil uncle Scar, and a big herd ended up running over uh, the, the big lion. Simba's dad ended up jumping in the way and pushing Simba out of the way, basically saving his life, and then the dad died. And Simba was not happy with this, obviously. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And Scar says, run away. And he ran, and he found a pig. Thank you. Warthog. I am not a pig, right? He found a warthog and a, what's it called, a meerkat? What's the amount? A meerkat. And, and basically decides that he's going to shirk his responsibility. Okay? He's, he's going to be take an easy street, right? You've, if you've seen the movie, Akuna Matata, you know, it, it means no worries. I'm not going to live up to the responsibility that I have. And Simba, because his dad was the rightful king, Simba was rightfully the king of the land. And he was shirking his responsibility. And, and there was this, this scene where Simba has a vision and it's a vision of, of his dad, and, and it, it goes like this, Mufasa, in my best Mufasa voice. Simba. <laughs> Father, Simba, you have forgotten me. No, how could I? You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than you have become. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Remember who you are. And Simba goes back. And of course, because he'd been neglecting his responsibility, the, the land was in shambles and, and things weren't the way that they were supposed to. But a lot of times, identity drives behavior. And it's important for us to remember who we are. We're people who have a tendency to forget very easily. We've... As, as we've been taking a look in Philippians, Paul just went through and, and explained how he had all these things to gain based on his resume, based on all these things that, that he had done. And if anybody could put confidence in the flesh, he's like, I got you beat. My resume is, is the kind of thing that, that would really stand up against the best of the people. And whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And, and he, he talks about how he, he just pursues the race, how he's pursuing the goal of knowing Christ. And so this is our outline this morning, and we're going to start with the example. If you have a note taker um, or, or worship guide, there are some blanks that are in there, and if you want to keep along with taking notes... And if anybody needs one, by the way, there's a gentleman back here who has some, and you can raise your hand if you're interested in having one and don't, and, and he'll get you one. But we start with the example. And it says that right there. He says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Now, first thing, I know there was a ladies' retreat. Anybody attend that? Yeah. So there was a ladies' retreat, and I haven't talked about this quite yet, but, but the word there is not just men, okay? This is, this is brothers and sisters, okay? Fellow Christians can, can be used here. So when, when the word in Greek is used for brothers and it's used in a plural sense, it's inclusive. The language is inclusive. New American Standard doesn't, doesn't translate it that way, but, but it's really brothers and, and sisters. And here, if, if you take a look at the entire book of Philippians, there are several verses that are kind of close together, like in 3.1 and 3, I think it's 14. There are several places in pretty close proximity where he uses this term. And he's asking the Philippians to follow example, not because he's achieved perfection. He says he hasn't done that yet, but because he's in the same race, same situation that they're running. Quite naturally, therefore, he identifies himself with them 
by the use of an affectionate and a humble term, brothers, brothers and sisters. And he's, he's putting themselves on their level here. And he says, join in following my example. This, this word, this, this phrase actually would be translated in the Greek, become my fellow imitators. And the, and the word for imitators there has a with prefix, and it's like, be my with imitator. And you go, lots of English versions are going to translate this in, in a way like it says here, join in following my example, and a lot of that's informed by the second part of the verse. But to a certain extent, he's saying, look, I'm an imitator. I'm a person who's imitating, and I want you to be my fellow imitator. It's somebody who joins others as an imitator. One, one reference, one commentary put it this way. He said, Paul himself was an imitator or a follower of Christ. The Philippians, therefore, were to be imitators or followers together with them. Paul puts it a different way in 1 Corinthians. He says, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Okay? Be an imitator of me, as I am of Christ. He says to observe those who walk according to the pattern. That, that has to do with paying careful attention to, looking at the way that they're living, observing this carefully. This according to the pattern is the word tupos, from, from which we get things like a type. It's a pattern. It's an example. Okay, it's, it's translated a lot of different ways in, in the New American Standard. Now, when I think of this, being a former pilot, I think of instrument approaches. I know it's a weird, weird connection to make, but, but bear with me. This is worth it, okay? And we had certain instruments that would tell us if we were like on, on center line for the runway, we'd be able to tell if we were left or right of center line. And there was another instrument that would tell us if we were too high or too low. And there was, there was an approach that we were supposed to take to get to the runway. And, and usually it was pretty, pretty good. This would tell us, this one on top, that little arrow would tell us if we were high or low. The one over here on the, on the bottom shows that you're a little bit right of where the center line should be. Okay, now the idea is, even if you couldn't see outside, even if there was bad weather, you could have an idea of where you were relative to the runway, as long as your instruments worked. <laughs> okay, you can't trust going visually to a runway if you can't see the runway. And sometimes it's hard to see. And sometimes, if your instruments don't work well, you have a problem. How, how are you gonna get to where you need to go? Well, one thing that we would do and that we would train for in pilot training was flying in formation. And so what we would do, if, if we would practice, if somebody's instruments were off, you would just tuck right in, right next to another airplane, and their instruments would fly the approach. And as long as you stay on their wing, as long as you're staying right next to them, tucked in tight, and you see them, when they break out of the clouds and they see the runway, you're gonna break out of the clouds and see the runway too. We'd fly a formation. But we don't learn formation when the weather's bad. We learn to fly formation when the weather's good. We practice when we can see better and, and when things are right. And it's pretty close. I mean, from wingtip to wingtip, there were like three feet. And it's, you know, if, if you've never been going 500 miles an hour, three feet away from another airplane, I encourage it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something to do, okay? But we, you practice in good weather. Okay, why? Because all of us at times in our walk with God sometimes get a little foggy and sometimes forget. We forget what it is that God has done for us. We don't remember the journeys that we've been on with the Lord. We don't remember the things that he's taught us. And so it's important to surround yourself. To, thank you. That was, that was the theme for the women's retreat, for those that are a little in the dark now as far as why that. It's important to surround yourself with people who are going to be on center line. 
It's important to tuck yourself in tight with people who know what they're doing and are on the right glide path. Because sometimes when, when our instruments maybe are a little bit off, you're dealing with circumstances, you're dealing with things that make things a little foggy. When you are surrounded by other people that are doing it right and that are imitating the Lord correctly, then you're going to make it home because we help each other, because we're built for a community and we're built to be living the Christian life together. The Christian life is not an individual sport, it's a team sport. And so we need, to, we need to tuck ourselves in. We need to fly formation even when we've got it going on right and, and we're seeing clearly and we see the Lord. It's important to develop those relationships of mentorship and mentoring and spending time in community with each other to encourage each other as long as it's still called today. Because eventually we're going to be home. And we want to encourage each other to to fight the fight and run the race well. So, in, in Hebrews, it's put this way. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. You can't do this if you're not in community with people. You can't do this if, if you're not living life together with people and, and you're tucked in close enough that you can see what the result of their life is or what the faith is that they are exercising on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you have to be in community. Paul says this again in, in Philippians chapter 4. He says, the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Okay, now, Paul says, imitate my example. And in the book of Philippians, he has given us a pattern already for things. Okay, first of all, he has prioritized the gospel. He's prioritized it. His life, his circumstances. It says in 12 through 14, I want you to know, brethren, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. He cares about the gospel. He views it as his life mission. In 121, he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. His his pattern, his example, puts a priority on the mission of telling other people about Christ. And, and in this passage in chapter one, as we looked at it several weeks ago, he goes, look, I'd rather go be with Christ. That's very much better. Amen? That's very much better. Okay, but, but to stay and to remain, that's fruitful labor. And, and it's, it's a tough decision, but I know that God is gonna keep me here for your faith. He's there because of ministry. He views his purpose as living for Christ, okay? So first, he prioritized the gospel. Second of all, he served people sacrificially as an offering. We saw this in chapter two. It said in verse 17, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. He viewed his relationship as one of self-sacrifice and service, and he was taking what he had to offer, even, even through suffering, and pouring it out as an offering on the service of their faith. We saw in chapter 3 that he pursued knowing Christ. It was his goal. It was what he was striving for. He says that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Continuing in, in 12 to 14, he goes, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He goes, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And this word for pressing on, 
dioko. It has an idea of moving rapidly, decisively toward an objective. One of the glosses that's used is he's pursuing Christ. It's his life mission. It's his life aim. It's the center line. It's the runway that he's hoping to, to land the plane on. It's what he's going for. He pursued knowing, knowing Christ. And he, we haven't gone to chapter four yet, but we will if the Lord doesn't come back and rapture us first. He had perspective on his circumstances. And look ahead with me at, at chapter four, verses 12 and 13. He goes, I know how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, he, he recognized, he had this perspective on all of his circumstances that no matter what happened, he could be content. He could thrive in these circumstances because Christ was strengthening him. And so he had this, this perspective. Follow that example. Simon says, do that, okay? Now do this. Uh, Simon didn't say, okay? Paul now puts a contrast up there, okay? And, and it's, it's kind of sandwiched. It's, it's these two verses, verses 18 and 19, and it's sandwiched between 17 and 20 and 21. And he, he says, look, there, there are some people that you don't want to follow, Okay, this is, this is the, the Simon says part where Simon doesn't say. This is the don't do this. Okay, and, and look, he goes, many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And as, as we take a look at these enemies, first of all, notice these four things that it says in verse 19. Their end is destruction. And I believe that as, as Paul goes through these four things in, in verse 19, he's creating a contrast for us. He wants us to go, okay, this is what it looks like to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. Don't do this. Don't be that guy. Okay? Their end is destruction. Okay? It says it right there in the verse. And this, this idea, this word end is actually a little bit of a word play with some things that Paul has said earlier in the chapter. The word is telos, okay? And that's, that's the noun version. It has to do with an end, a conclusion, or a goal. Now, the word, the verb form, has to do with bringing something to completion, to accomplish, to fulfill, or to make perfect. And we see that earlier in verse 12. And he says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, same verb, or same, same root. It's the verb form of the noun that's used there. Haven't become perfect. We, we take a look. There's an adjective word there too, which has to do with completion or perfection, and, and he used that in verse 15. Okay, let us therefore as many as are mature, as many as are perfect. And it, if, you, if you take a look at what he says here when, when he says their end, he's already talked about what our end is. As believers, when we're pursuing Christ, our end is maturity. Our end is perfection. Our end is the holiness that God will complete in us in the day of Christ Jesus, as it says in chapter 1, verse 6. Okay? We've got this, this goal, this end of spiritual maturity that we're working towards as believers. Their end is destruction. Okay? Don't be that guy. Okay, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he puts it this way. He says, after all, it is only just, only just, for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And you see, our aim, our goal is to know Christ to enjoy him, to be with him forever. 
You know, that's our aim. They're going to be away from the presence of the Lord forever, these enemies of the cross of Christ. And chapter 1 in, in verses 28 and 29, Paul even talks about the opponents, and he says, this is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. They're enemies. They're on the wrong team. They're not there. So first of all, their end is destruction. Second of all, it says their God is their appetite. Their God is their appetite. Um, in Romans 16, Paul gives a commentary on, on these same types of people. And he says, these men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. This, this one guy, John Chrysostom, uh, 349 to 407, uh, 407 AD. This is an actual driver's license photograph. Um, he puts it this way. Your belly is given to you so that you may nourish it, not so that it may burst. Your body is given to you that you may rule it, not so that you may have it as a mistress. It's given that it may serve you for the nourishment of the other members, not so that you may serve it. Don't exceed these bounds. The sea and flood does not so much harm to the boundaries as our belly does to our bodies and our souls. See, our, our God shouldn't be our appetites or our desires, okay? Our God is the one true God, okay? Earlier in, in chapter 3, um, Paul says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God. Worship in the Spirit of God, the true God, the one that indwells us, the third person of, of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, indwells his church. What a mystery and what a, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. It reminds me of, of the way that in Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and it says, walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. And sometimes our appetites want to do things that are contrary to what God wants us to do and what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And there's, there's a tension there. Anybody in, in this body forgotten how to sin once you trusted Christ? We don't, okay? There, there are still desires and things like that, that that we have, and we have to walk by the Spirit. And it says that there's going to be a battle there. In Philippians 3.3, it, it says... We worship in the Spirit of God, and, and it goes on to say that um, we glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. I bring this on because the next thing that the enemies do is they glory in their shame. Now, this, this idea of glorying in their shame, this, um, this word shame has an idea of either being something that's dishonorable, you know, uh, uh, something that's contrary to ideas of modesty, an experience of something that's disgraceful, or it could have to do with the deed itself, a commission of an act that's shameful, a shameful deed, okay? And, and when you say that, in Romans 6, Paul says, what benefit were you deriving from the things to which you were now ashamed? Okay, this group of people gloried in their shameful deeds or in the things that, that were just not appropriate. Okay, our glory is in Christ Jesus. And the fourth thing here, they set their minds on earthly things. They set their minds on earthly things. Um, now, as you see this and you see these words, set your minds... This, this word is the same word that's used in verse 15, where it's have this attitude. And so when he says, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, or, or in chapter 2, verse 5, have this attitude, which was also in Christ Jesus, this setting the minds in this verse, same Greek word as having this attitude. So they have an attitude that's set on earthly things. 
as opposed to our attitude, which is supposed to be having the attitude that Paul had, where he was pursuing Christ, chasing Christ, running the race with his eyes set on the goal of knowing Christ for the reward. Okay? So, huge, huge contrast. Our mindset needs to be knowing Christ, pursuing that goal, and their mindset was on earthly things. Now, as, as I see this, this is one of the weird warped ways that my mind works. I think of a person sucking an egg. And I know what you're thinking. How in the world do you see a person sucking an egg here? Okay, well, it's because as I look at this, as I try to remember it, okay, and I see that their end is destruction, their God is their appetite, their glory is in their shame, and they set their minds on earthly things. I see some eggs. Okay? I see eggs. Now, don't be an egg sucker. Okay? This is what we're not supposed to do. And it should be challenging to us. As you evaluate yourself, is your mind set, is your attitude about this world? Is it about earthly things? Is your God your appetite or your belly, your desires? Is your glory and shame? This this is not the kind of behavior that a Christian should have. These people are described as enemies of the cross of Christ. And and as, as Paul frames this, He goes, look, join in following my example. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. As I'm following Christ, as I'm on center line, tuck in. Surround yourself with mentorship. Be the kind of person that is is following the glide path as you're following other people that are coming down the glide path also. So that you can make it to where you need to be in a place of maturity and sanctification as your Christian life. Don't be an egg sucker. Okay? This isn't appropriate. And it's, it's not who we should be as believers. Don't set your mind on earthly things. But here's the encouragement. This is who we are. And it's found in verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state in a conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. And you thought you were going to get away with it. (laughs) You thought I was not going to remember or to have you do this this morning, but you were wrong. So please stand up. (laughs) You thought you were going to get away with it. Okay. Okay. Here we go. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Outstanding. Okay, next. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Now, 
I do have to say, if I hear about this later, I did not make all of them blanks. There is a word there. <laughs> so I didn't go to all blanks yet. That's coming. You can, you can imagine that it will come. Here we go. For Outstanding. Have your seats, please. Great job. So that's good. Let me give you that encouragement. This is important. Why? This is who we are. And we have to remember who we are. And I see several things here that are incredibly encouraging. Okay? First of all, first point, our present identity and citizenship is in heaven. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have trusted in the work that Christ did on the cross to pay for your sins, if you believe that he died, was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures to pay a sin debt that you could not pay on your own, the way that scripture says this is that your citizenship is in heaven presently. Our citizenship is. This is a present tense verse. It's not future. You have a citizenship in a place that you can't see right now. You have a citizenship in a place that you are geographically separated from. You don't belong here. And that's a good thing. Because a place where we belong is a place where there will be no more sin. There will be no more crying. There will be no more death. There will be no more tears. We are citizens of a place that is not broken. Okay? That's encouragement. That's good. Okay, second of all, our Savior is coming back. All right? That's good. Okay? That's good. We eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to come back. He is going to rule here. He is going to fix this broken place. He is going to rule until all of his enemies are under his feet, and that last enemy is death. Okay? He's coming back to rule. Okay? We're waiting for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word for Lord is one who is in charge in charge by virtue of possession, one who is in position of authority, a lord, a master. I believe in the book of Revelation. When, when we take a look at chapters 6 and 7 and Jesus starts opening those seals, that, and, and it doesn't say, this is speculation, but based on some things in Jeremiah, I believe that that is a title deed to the earth and that he is ripping open those seals to reclaim what he rightfully owns. Okay, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back and he is going to rule here and he is in a position of authority. He is the Lord. Okay? More than that, someday every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Okay? He, he wins. He wins. Okay? That's good. That's encouragement. He's coming back to rule. Okay? He's going to transform us, okay? This is good too. So yesterday while you ladies were having all your fun and, and doing your stuff, I was actually inspired. We had a little meeting yesterday and I heard that Robert, was, Robert Riggs over here was having some mulch delivered and I said, that's a good idea. So I decided that I was going to go do some landscaping. You didn't know you inspired me, did you? Yeah, well you did. I was inspired. And my back hurts today. <laughs> if, I, if, I'm, yeah, if I'm like walking a little slower or something like that, did you know that he is going to transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory? We are going to have bodies that don't suffer anymore, don't have aches and pains, no more arthritis, no more cancer, no more anything like that. He is going to transform us into conformity with the body of his glory, his glorious body. That's good. That's good news. 
I, I love the way that he puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, indeed, while we're in this tent, this body, we groan. Anybody groan when they get out of bed? Okay, you, you younger, younger folks, you'll get there. Okay, you're, you're not there yet. Okay, but, but sometimes there's some groaning, being burned. We don't want to be unclothed, but closed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. This is good. This is encouragement. And you know what? He has the power to do that. You know that? Uh, look, look at what it says. By the exertion of the power he has even to subject all things to himself. Okay? In Colossians, it says he holds all things together. In him, all things hold together. I can't imagine the explosive power of all the atoms spontaneously splitting if he let go. Okay? He created everything by the word of his power. In him, all things hold together. He has the power to subject all things to himself, and he's going to exert that power. He wins. Slam dunk. Take the microphone and drop it. Game over. Okay, we're on a, if, if you have trusted Christ, you are on a winning team. Okay, why are you on a winning team? Because Jesus wins. It's not because any of us are winners. It's, it's because Jesus wins. And if, if you're tucked in, surrounded by people that are trying to seek him and trying to know him, you're on the right path. Okay? That should be encouraging. That should be exciting. That, sh that should be one of those kinds of things where, where you look at our identity and what we have, and you find encouragement in that. It's the point of the book. What does it look like to live out our lives as citizens of heaven? Okay? And then there's an exhortation. This exhortation is found in, in 4.1. And he says, Therefore, my beloved Brothers and sisters, whom I long to see, he told us that in chapter one, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And, and it's interesting to me that right after talking about citizenship and talking about where we belong as citizens of heaven, that he immediately turns around and says, stand firm. He kind of does that in chapter one too. Because if you remember these, this verb at the beginning where it says, conduct yourselves in a manner, the word that's used there means behave as a citizen. It's a Greek verb that says, exercise your duties as a citizen well. Walk well as a citizen worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so, so the last time one of these Greek words was used that implied the citizenship or, or implied our identity, he goes on to say, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, our, our identity, the fact that we are citizens of heaven, means that we can stand firm. We have the result to because we are standing in Christ. And guess what? He's solid. He's solid. He's trustworthy. And he's powerful. So, so that's, that's our outline this morning. Remember who you are. And, and just like Simba had forgotten who he was, and because he forgot who he was, he wasn't acting out his identity as, as the true king of the land. What about you? As a citizen of heaven, where is your priority? Where is your mindset? What's your attitude? What are the things that make you tick? What are you concerned about? What are the things that drives what you do or who you are? Is it your citizenship in heaven? Is it your pursuit of Christ? I think of 2 Peter. And, and we'll... we'll close with this, and then, then just an encouragement of application. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, Peter says, well, <laughs> thank you. 
Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten. Having forgotten his purification from his former sins. You see, if, if you're not growing in holiness, if you're not growing in these qualities in your walk with God, if you're not pursuing the Lord and as a result seeking to purify yourself as he is pure, as it says in 1 John 3, then you're acting like you're nearsighted, myopic, myopic, myopic. You're acting like you're blind. (laughs) Because the reality is that we were created for a place that's different than this one and for a place that's good. So what do we do with this? As as we take a look at at the passage that we had here in Philippians, and and we see what it says about who we are, and the kinds of things that that we're supposed to do, what what is our takeaway? What is it that you should do? And I'm gonna say recognizing, recognizing who you are in Christ, that your citizenship is in heaven, stand firm. Model your behavior after mentors who are striving to know Christ and to grow in holiness themselves. Find people that you can either be a good wingman to or a good lead for. And model that as we all seek to be on the right path, the right glide path with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I I just thank you for your word. I, I thank you for the incredible truth that your son, Jesus, God the Son, has a power to subject all things to himself. God, we eagerly look forward to the day when Jesus returns. Lord, help us be ready. God, I pray that you would help us to abide in him so that when he appears, we can have confidence and not shrink in shame at his coming. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as as we try to live the Christian life together, as we try to seek to know Christ, as we spend time in his presence and in in time with the community that you've given to us, that, that we might grow in our passion for you in our desire for you, God, that um, we, would, we would make your name famous in, in DeSoto and in Duncanville and Cedar Hill. Lord, we just thank you for the incredible calling that you've given to us. We thank you for your word and the encouragement that it is. I just pray that you would give us opportunities to share the gospel with people who don't know you this week. Lord, I pray that, that our lives would be an offering of worship to you. It's in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Can we stand together? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonder. Turn your
the things of earth say. And the things of earth will grow strangely in the light of His glory and grace. What truth in that song, huh? So this week, as you go out, look for opportunities. Don't be an egg sucker. Okay? Follow the Lord wholeheartedly. May he guide you, and may you have gospel opportunities. You're dismissed.